Date point. Unknown. AV. Classify facility. Earth. Time behaved strangely in the cell. There was nothing to do, nothing to look at or inspire him. For the sake of having anything to do, Six found himself doing some exercise he could remember seeing being practiced on the beach in San Diego, though he had no idea if he was doing them right. That alone might be an indicator of his non-human status, and he was undoubtedly being surveilled. But it was that, or nothing. So he exercised, he slept, he was fed, and led, ears and eyes covered, to a simple bathroom where he was allowed to perform his stolen body's necessary abulations and clean himself. They even provided him with clean clothing. It was the only vaguely interesting thing to happen for what felt like it must have been the best part of two days. It was a strange relief, therefore, to be finally retrieved by his tactone handlers, never the same handlers twice, nor did they speak to him except to issue orders, and ushered back into the interview room. The questions became, oddly, less pointed, less targeted. They started to query him about some bizarre things, claiming that it was all about getting to know him. Questions like his favourite foodstuffs and his preferred recreational activity were easy enough to answer from his limited pool of human experience. Others, however, were truly strange. A favourite colour? As if there was something preferable about the one narrow slice of the EM spectrum over any other arbitrary slice. The question was impenetrably strange to him. He just took a random stab and replied, green. That was after what felt like weeks, however. Once he had bored of playing the game of refusing to answer. Nothing seemed to faze Stephen, who seemed equally content to ask the same stupid questions again and again, and was equally comfortable with any answer, or even none. It was strange. He seemed to just... genuinely enjoy Six's company. Six found he had no option but to look forward to Stephen's company and his interrogations. They were the only thing that broke the monotony. Sleep? Eat? Excrete? Every so often he was taken to a large featureless room where there was room to walk and the floor was padded for basic exercises under the watchful silent eye of his handlers. Every day he was given the opportunity to clean up and put on fresh clothing. Every time he returned to his cell after leaving, it had been cleaned and the bedding replaced. He was being exceptionally well looked after but there was nothing to do. At all. The introduction of a second interrogator, Carl, Always felt like the opening of a whole new world of experience. He was similar to Stephen in most respects, a little lower and more gravelly of voice, a little less handsome but equally polite, equally patient, equally insightful. Neither man allowed even the faintest hint of a discrepancy to pass. They would pounce on it, pry at it, probe it with questions and unrelenting logic. They would repeat the same question over and 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 over again and again and again and again. It was like being slowly and inefficiently murdered with words, and no matter how often it happened, no matter how aware he was of what they were doing, the sheer irritation of it always teased out just a little bit more from him, just another detail in the hope that maybe this crumb would convince them to stop asking. With each one, they eroded yet another figment of his lies, exposing the truth one grain at a time until all his forces were gone. Dissected in painstaking detail and incinerated under the glare of incomprehensibly patient scrutiny. Despite this, the sheer novelty of having a second person to talk to was like emerging to feel the cool breeze on his face. That became his routine, if such a word could even apply to something that seemed to happen totally at random throughout his day. Sometimes it was Stephen, sometimes it was Carl. Either way, the sessions became the only interesting part of his day. Today, it was Stephen. He didn't even acknowledge Six's presence for several minutes. He just read the dossier, occasionally jotting a note or something in it. As they turned, and as the pencil scratch scratched its way across them, those thick paper pages made a noise that echoed pleasantly in Six's head, and he entered a kind of trance just listening to the soft sound. He was jolted out of it when the dossier was flipped closed with a sharp snap. Hello, Six, Stephen said, as if he hadn't just spent who knew how long ignoring the detainee. They both always began the session with those same words. Hello, Stephen. Did you sleep well? They always asked that. The answer was always the same. Not really. Hmm, Stephen frowned. 
You've been here a while now. I would have expected you to adapt to it by now. Maybe you need a more comfortable bed. By Six's star standards, even a change to a slightly more comfortable bed sounded like bliss. Is that an option? He asked. One personality module in one implant sneered and chastised himself for the pathetic eagerness that he totally failed to keep out of his voice. It could be, but you are a detainee here, you know. Why should I give you special treatment? Of course, you wouldn't just offer something like that without a price. Quid pro quo, yes? Stephen didn't react beyond a slight uptick in the light smile he always wore. I'm going to repeat a few questions we've gone over before, he said. Oh, go on. What's your name? You're asking me that again? The absurdity of it jolted Six right up to the terse mood he'd been trying to slip into. It had been the very first question Stephen had asked him, long since answered. Why would he pointlessly resurrect it now? What's your name? Stephen repeated. Six snorted. Mr. Johnson, he replied sarcastically. Stephen's head waved around and he smiled slightly, as if the sarcasm were amusing rather than irritating. Please tell me your name, he insisted. Six sighed. Six. He was pleased to discover that the keyboard sounds were just as pleasant as ever when Stephen wrote something. What's your real name, Six? That is my real name. Really? Sounds more like a number to me. Surely you weren't born as little baby Six. You presume a lot about me, Stephen. What, that you were born? I think that one's a pretty universal constant, even if you are an E.T. Six said nothing. Stephen just smiled that gentle smile of his. I'm sorry, I didn't ask you if you were comfortable. I am, thank you. How was your meal? Filling. That was about all it had been. That's good, so. Which is it? What? Well, six is a number, and no culture I ever heard of named their kids after numbers, so either you're not human, or else you're lying about your name, or both, of course. We name our kids some pretty strange things, Six said. Who do? Humans. But you aren't human, though, are you? So you keep claiming. But when there's a woman called Moon Unit Zapper out there, you can hardly use the fact that my name is Six as evidence of that, can you? Stephen's little tilt of the head might have indicated concession. That argument might hold more water if your head wasn't stuffed full of alien technology, he said. Six considered his response, trying to map out the potential future past of the conversation. He could claim to be a former abductee, but that would fall apart soon enough. Too many inventions stacked on top of each other. He'd slip and allow a discrepancy eventually. He could... So, why did you bomb that apartment in New Jersey? Stephen asked, completely throwing him with the non secateur. Fortunately, the truth here would work to his advantage. That wasn't me. That was your associate, then. Considering you aren't brothers, you really look very much alike. And how do you know we aren't brothers? Genetic testing. You may look identical, but you couldn't be less related. I... What about that roller derby? What did you hope to gain by shooting up a bunch of kids and their parents? I didn't have a gun. I wasn't... Why did you kill Terry Boone? Who? San Diego, the car park. You killed her with a grenade launcher. Why? I didn't do that. That's funny, because for that one, we have DNA evidence that says it was you. So why did you kill her? Like I said, it wasn't me. We have all the evidence which proves that it was you, so why did you kill her? This is getting tiresome. Why did you kill Terry Boone? Why did you kill Terry Boone? Would you stop that? Answer the question and I'll stop. Why did you kill... It wasn't me. You're lying. Why did you... Fine! Six exploded. I'm not human. I'm an independent consciousness capable of uploading myself into any appropriate host. I wasn't even on Nerve when this body killed Boone. Thank you, Stephen said mildly. He tapped away at his computer again and Six calmed a little, shaking as the full weight of what had happened hit him. The words had erupted out of him on a tide of frustration, driven by his total deprivation of anything resembling an intellectual stimulus for... He didn't know. Mums? It felt like mums. 
Passman could only figuratively gape, aghast that the secret he had guarded all of that time was finally thrown away, mined out of him by nothing but boredom. What? You believe that? He asked, trying to fill his voice with scorn, hoping that mockery might salvage his failure. We already know that's what the hierarchy is, Stephen said, still typing. I just needed to hear you say it. Now you're lying, Six accused. The door opened behind him, and his hand has returned. Detainee, please stand, they ordered. Stephen gathered his things, nodded to him, and made to leave by the opposite door. Come back here, Six snapped, surging to his feet as far as his restraints would allow, and strain against them. Come back here, you. You're lying. Stephen didn't even dignify that accusation with a response. Six's handlers handled him. He seethed in the dark every step of the long and winding walk back to his cell, which seemed to take twice as long as it usually did. When they finally arrived, he found that his bed had been replaced, and a small table and chair introduced to the room. There were some coarse paper pages, and a graphite stick. Six's bruised pride hated himself for the way he was pathetically grateful for them. Date point. Third year. Eighth month. Third week. A.V. Scotch Creek Extraterrestrial Research Facility, British Columbia, Canada. During the deployment of the civilian colonists, we were able to send over a smaller version of the jump array, installed right here at Scotch Creek, Higgins began. Jenkins raised a hand. Uh, I'm sorry, jump array? I thought they were travelling on Kirk's ship. The jump array is, as far as we can tell, a uniquely human invention, Tremblay said. Bartlett came up with it. Point-to-point -point transport of material via wormhole between any two array stations. One ends here on base. The other end of that big array is on Kirk's ship. Cool. Well, anyway, Higgins continued. We assembled a smaller version, which we're calling the Postbox. It's a useful way to support the colony. They can send back written messages and USB sticks to stay in touch. We can send over spare parts, medical supplies... Right now we're sending over the pieces to construct a coffin-sized version for transit of individual persons. Yesterday, the military commander there, Captain Owen Powell, sent us back this urgent report. The lights dimmed again, and Temba selected a video file. The face addressing the camera was a tired-looking, bearded man, wearing a black pullover and a dull green beanie. Project Stars FCO's data report. 15.30 hours. Mission Day 82. He recited, in a thick accent that reminded Kevin of Sean Bean. Saunders came back, broadcasting IFF this time, thankfully. He's given us a couple of starships he claims to store from the hierarchy. I'm going to repeat my request to get some experts in ET tech assigned here ASAP. He's right. We need people who can take these things apart. Bad news is, the bad things don't have jump drives, so we can't send them back to Earth for analysis. The worst news is that this is just two. Saunders kept a third, added probably a whole lot of this class of ship. They have better than best cloaking tech, and so do their missiles. These aren't small ships, neither. They're bigger than an aircraft carrier, about as heavily armed as a cruiser. Of what I saw, they're equipped for assault, bombardment, and invasion. There's got to be some kind of a shipyard out there making these things. I've talked it out with Sir Jeremy, and our recommendations are as follows. 1. We need to get the coffin set up and bring forward the schedule for the full-scale array. 2. I want to raise the system shield and go public. Sooner we do it, the less likely we are to have some infiltrator sneak in and drop a beacon. Free. I'm going to need naval crews to assign to these things, and somebody who knows how to refit them with a jump drive. Four. Saunders thinks we should keep them here to defend the colony. I disagree. I think there's a shipyard out there that needs capturing if possible. I'm blowing the fuck up if not. My lads are itching for a real mission. No further recommendations at this time. He speaks some water before continuing. The other half of Saunders' delivery, which you'll probably find more immediately useful, is enclosed. The hierarchy he keeps talking about apparently have the ability to treat a mind like a data file. Transfer it, store it, run it on computers. I've gone over that in a previous report. This time, he's delivered the... He called it the dissected consciousness of a hierarchy agent known as Zero. We can't make heads or tails of it, but he's got a friend who can interrogate it. Encloses what's been learned so far. I'm inclined to trust it. He rubbed his beard. The existence of a hierarchy cell on Earth seems likely. Hopefully the information in this document will help intelligence catch the buggers. He examined some paperwork for a second, thinking. Now test to report militarily. Colonial militia training is going well. So Jeremy's civilian report will follow in due time. 
I consider this high priority, so I'm sending now. Powell out. Higgins turned the lights back up. Saunders is an Australian abductee, he clarified, and apparently something of a practical expert in alien technology. He crash-landed an Alliance cruiser on Simbreen a few weeks ago, and was cooperative in sharing intelligence and technology with the project. It's thanks to him that this facility has a working cloaking device to study. Educated by his own example, some of the SPS divers were able to retrieve examples of working alien power generators. As for the contents of the report, Timber picked up, is details, pretty much in full, what exactly the hierarchy is. Date point. Third year, 11th month, second week, AV. National Air and Space Museum, Washington DC, USA, Earth. It's amazing how much you can come to care about an inanimate object. Riley wasn't accustomed to public speaking. Nor was she accustomed to dressing for official functions or historic moments. She felt more comfortable in a jumpsuit or her flight suit than in a dress. I admit, I'm in love with Pandora. Together, we created history. I'd fly her forever if I could. But Pandora doesn't belong to me. With the retirement of the Lockheed Martin TS 101 X plane, she now belongs to history. And I am proud that she will continue to serve and inspire mankind here in this illustrious Smithsonian Museum. Camera flashes caught every moment. She knew they'd comment that she was crying. She didn't care. She was allowed to mourn the turning of this page. She stretched up and tiptoed to kiss Pandora's nose, and rested her forehead against the plane's cool hull, ignoring the redoubled sparkle of the media for a few seconds. Then she collected herself and turned back to the microphone, accepting the museum director's offered handkerchief as he asked the reporters for questions. Date point. Unknown. A.V. Classified facility, Earth. So, what did he write? Looks like mostly doodling. Monitoring the detainee's scribbles and notes was a routine operation, done whenever they cleaned up his cell while he was outside of it. It wasn't a difficult process. One or two quick snaps with the camera was all it took. There was a lot that could be learned about the detainee from what they chose to jot down by way of entertaining themselves. The pages were densely packed with what appeared to be mostly nonsense and doodles, scribbles, spirals, zigzag lines. There was a kind of aesthetic to it, a bit a Spartan mathematical one. Six's lines were mostly either parallel or perpendicular, or at least as much so as could be managed by unpractised human hands. Beyond that, he didn't seem to care what he drew, so long as the graphite made a stimulating sound on the paper. Mostly. It was just a geometric, right-angled mess. Not a lot to go on. No. She looked around at the team. Her job went both ways. As psychologist, not only was she there to analyse and hypothesise about the detainee's reactions, she was there to keep an eye on the gators and their intel support, make sure they were holding up okay. It was a fact little suspected by the civilian world that interrogation was practically as hard on the people conducting it as upon their detainee. While the interrogators had the luxury of seeing the outside world, freedom of movement, nice meals, unlimited entertainment and all the perks of being a free American citizen, at the end of the day they were still tearing a man apart piece by piece to learn the things he held most dear. Only a true psychopath could have done that without being torn up in turn, and a psychopath simply wouldn't have a place on this team. And Six was proving to be a tough nut to crack. Stephen and Carl were both veterans and experts, having done this many times before. Their information had saved lives. They knew how to cope. But there was always the possibility that this time might be the time that all their expertise and coping mechanisms failed them. Their veterancy was not an excuse for her to become lax in monitoring them. She watched the two booth guys for a minute. They were talking, quietly, and while both looked stressed and subdued, there was no immediate causes for alarm that she could detect. Long term. Well, maybe she could recommend something that would be good for both of them, and for the detainee. Date point. Third year, 11th month, third week, AV. Dominion Embassy Station 172, Terra Luna, L1 point. Are you okay? Sister Naral had elected to remain aboard the Embassy Station until her pregnancy forced her back to Gao. The preliminary results were encouraging. She was expecting triplets, and if she'd been human, might have been called glowing. 
As it was, she was the first person Riley went to after the unpleasant necessity of the Smithsonian meetings, speeches, interviews and photographs. Any awkwardness between them was long since past, and over the months since, as the last few flights of the TS-101 had wound down, they had become fast friends. Narelle, as it turned out, loved to groom her sister's fur, and this work extended to human hair. Riley kept it short by necessity. Long hair and space helmets did not mix, but it felt good to let her non-human friend work on it. Riley sighed. I will be, she said. I always knew Pandora was an X-plane, a prototype. She's wonderful, but she's not a patch on what companies like Globar can produce now that they know what they're doing. You'll be flying the replacement? Hey, my career's not over just because they're retiring my sled, Riley told her, though I'm being headhunted by the private sector. Lots of big money being flashed at me to try and get me to quit NASA and test pilot their designs. Narell issued a kind of melodic purr that Riley had learned past for the equivalent of a hmm in her species. That doesn't sound like you at all, she said. Nope. I'm in it for the science, for the species, not to get rich while I make some billionaires even richer. What do you think it'll be like? The replacement? Similar, Riley admitted. A lot went right with the 101, but it was, you know, the tolerances were looser because we didn't know what it would be like, and that hurts performance. I think only you would notice the difference, Nerell commented, choosing a Gaurian laugh. As a diplomat herself, the fields of aeronautics and piloting were outside her experience, but she had gathered enough from the arguments between the two pilots in her life to know that Riley's constant maintenance and tuning of her sled was enough to earn margins that any Gaurian pilot would have considered not worth the effort. Hey, the little differences add up. 0.5% might not sound like much, but at the kind of accelerations we think these things will get up to in the field, that could be the difference between a fatal hit and a clean miss. There's other things too. Are ES field techs improving by leaps and bounds? The JPRs turned out their most efficient warp engine yet? You watch. I'll always love Pandora, but I'm not dumb enough to think that her replacement will be worse. It'll be better. Way better. So what are you doing in the interim? Nero asked. Classified. Sorry, babe. Nero knew better than to pry, so the two sat in comfortable silence for a few minutes before the quarter spoke an untranslated sentence of the Gaurian dialect. To Riley's untrained ear, it sounded not dissimilar to Korean. A launch, the Gaurian said, abandoning Riley's scout to spring over the window. I still can't quite believe your people still use rockets. Well, they've got kinetics in the S-fields now, Riley said, joining her. There was something fun about watching a launch from orbit, and Earth's gravity hasn't changed. They're still the best way to haul bulk stuff into orbit for us. Technically, kinetics was a gross misnomer, which routinely earned an impromptu lecture on correct definitions for anybody who was so incautious as to utter it within earshot of scientific pendants or on the internet. But the translated alien vernacular was tenacious. It was hardly surprising that it had been one of time's words of the year, given that the introduction of what was, after all, an extremely small and efficient engine had decimated the cost per kilogram of material transport from ground to orbit, revitalising the space industry practically overnight. From where the station rested at the Terra Luna L1 point, Earth was much, much too far away to make out such a tiny event as a launch with the naked eye of course, but the station took care of that, zooming and magnifying to an incredible degree, so that the vehicle became a spike of light atop a pillar, smoking its way up from the curvature of the planet. The perspective was a little false, but it looked cool as hell. How can this thing zoom in? She asked. Nirar spoke to the Wingarian again. It was curious how directions to the station's controlling systems didn't get translated, and the view zoomed in even further, until the rocket itself filled the view. A sender white spike marked down its flank with the library of several world famous companies, the so called Big Ten, that were cooperating in the second space race. Oh my god, that's the Festus One! Riley exclaimed. I forgot that was today. Hephaestus 1? Yeah, it's the first flight out of Ceres, Riley explained. They're going to set up an asteroid mining hub and ship out there. Your people move fast, Nero remarked, clearly impressed. It took us 10 gallon years to launch our first asteroid mining operation. How long is that in Earth years? Room? The room displayed a conversion table on the window, alongside the view of the rocket. Riley read it and nodded. I bet I know the reason, she said. Will this room take voice commands from me? It should do. Great. Riley looked around, then shrugged and commanded, Uh, room? Display side-by-side -side comparisons of the estimated number of asteroids in the Sol system versus the Gao system, 
and displays surface maps for rare earth elements on earth and the planet Gao. Grass and two globes appeared side by side on the walls and windows as the station's interface systems interpreted the command and expanded on it, trying to guess not only what Riley had asked for, but also what she might not yet know she wanted. She had to admit, as unimpressive as some of the achievements of non-human life were, when it came to user-friendly interfaces, they were the absolute masters. It looked like something straight out of a movie, but practical. Every element was clearly presented, its relationship to every other obvious. She took a moment to appreciate the accomplishment before turning to the relevant data. See here? Sol has a huge density of inner system asteroids next to Gao, she said. And then over here, look. Your home is pretty rich in rare herbs and they're all spread out pretty evenly, but Earth is poor in rare herbs and they're mostly here under the control of only a couple of political factions, but there's a boatload in the asteroids. She indicated a chart demonstrating the estimated absolute tonnage of various elements and minerals in the asteroid belt. And we need rare earth magnets to build ES fuel generators, and ES fuel generators are a huge boom industry right now. So getting out there quickly ensures that the supply remains constant and averts a future problem? Sensible, Nirel said. Riley laughed. So getting out there quickly ensures that a whole bunch of very rich people get even richer, she countered. You don't sound like you mind that, Nirel said. Why should I? It works. You said it yourself, it took you guys twice as long to do this. It sounds... greedy, Narel objected. Yeah, greed is good, girl. Narel just stared at her. Riley, if it wasn't for the sex thing, that would be the most alien thing you've ever said to me. Riley just shrugged. Room, clear the data, focus on the rocket again. They watched it separate the stage. Force fields unfolded around and behind it, catching the solar wind and reminding Riley of an ancient sail ship as they swept Hephaestus One's path clear of orbital debris and sucked down power for the warp engine. It took only seconds. In a flare of light, the private rocket leapt into the impossible distance and was gone. Alien or not, honey, there's the proof, she said. Date point, unknown. Classified facility, Earth. Hello, Six. How are you feeling today? Did you sleep well? How's the new bed? Not talking to me. Okay. Let me know if you want to talk. The unspeakable bastard just got out a deck of playing cards and started to deal them out on the desk in front of him, playing some kind of a game, as if Six's stubborn science were of exactly no consequence to him. The sound washed over him, as it always seemed to. He wondered if that was why Stephen used these tools, because he too enjoyed the sound they made. Was it a quirk of the way humans saw the world? That simple things could be so... mesmerizing? Bees me why I bother with the cards, Stephen commented. I could play on the computer instead. That didn't seem like an attractive option. Hey, do you want this desk? The offer surprised him. Surely Stephen wasn't serious. But then again, he'd been true to his word about the bed. No. It was just a trick to get him to give up and start talking again. He wouldn't be swayed that easily, and so Six folded his arms and continued to glare. Suit yourself. Stephen finished his game and put the cards away. Surprisingly, he stood up. I guess you're not in the mood today? That's cool. We'll do something a little different. See you in a few minutes. He exited the room as the guards entered. Six knew better than to resist by now, but he was curious about this, something a little different, and his pulse picked up a little as the guards led him to somewhere that had an indefinably different texture to the area around his cell and the interrogation room. It was hard to tell. The human body had senses he was sure weren't quite analogous to anything else he had experienced. Despite the total disorientation of the darkness and silence, he could still somehow feel that the area around him was not the same, somehow. There was a feeling of volume. The sensation was validated when his blindfold was removed. He was somewhere new, a larger area, still totally enclosed, but big enough to run if he so wanted. There was a hoop of some kind attached to the wall a little above head height, and some markings on the ground. Stephen and Carl were both waiting for him, having apparently changed into plain loose clothing that looked much more comfortable than their suits, and a pair of soft shoes. 
Carl was holding a stipled orange spear with black lines on its surface. What's this? Six asked, then cursed himself for giving in to the surprise as his shackles were removed and the guards retired to stand watchfully at the door. Basketball, Carl said, and then threw the ball to the ground. It bounced back up, and he gently flung it down again with his other hand. The idea is to get the ball to fall through that hole on the wall, and stop me from doing the same. You can't run while holding the ball, though. You have to bounce it on the floor like this, he demonstrated, swapping the ball from hand to hand via the hard surface. What's your angle here, gentlemen? Six asked, suspiciously. Carl threw the ball gently to Stephen, who caught it and spun it on one finger in a display of impressive coordination. No angle. This is a morale and welfare session now. You need the stimulation and exercise, he said. So, it's a reward for good behaviour? That too, Stephen agreed. Come on, you going to play or not? His arms punched straight out, flinging the ball at six, who astonished himself by catching the high-speed object. He considered resisting, but after the sheer grey sameness of the last few weeks, how could he? He knew he was being manipulated. He knew this was just another tool in the arsenal that these people were using to dissect him and extract his valuable knowledge. But no amount of willpower in the world could stop him from being, on everything but the purely cerebral level, shamelessly eager to move, to play, to do something different. He bounced the ball. When the session ended, who knew how long later, he was exhausted, but he felt alive, and something approaching happy for the first time since arriving in this place.